everyone. Thank you very much for being here tonight at this time. We are very pleased and honored to be here presenting um, a report on the situation of children and adolescents in the United States adult criminal system, uh, justice system here. Um, welcome and thank you to everyone that is here on the table. I will be introducing you uh, as you speak. We are very happy to have each and every one of you. And I will give um, the floor to our, the president of the commission and to the rapporteur uh, for the United States of the Inter-American Commission, uh, Commissioner Margaret Macaulay. President Macaulay holds a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of London and is currently an attorney in private practice. She serves as mediator in the Supreme Court of Jamaica and associate arbitrator, as well as serving as notary public. She's, she served as a judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights from 2007 to 2012, contributing to the formulation of the court's rules of procedure. She's an honored member of the Gen Gender Justice Legacy Wall of notable women's rights advocates who have brought about important changes, which was launched in December 2017 at the United Nations in New York during the Assembly of Ministers. She took part in the reform and drafting of laws in Jamaica and is well known as a strong proponent of an authority on women's rights. She's a citizen of Jamaica and we're very honored to have her presiding this presentation. Oh, I shouldn't touch that. <coughs> yes. um, thank you so much, Marisol. Um, I don't think I'm presiding. I, I'm, I, I thought tonight I was sort of, uh, I have a soft, soft position. My sister Esmeralda has all the work to do <laughs> today. So I just have a very short statement to make, but it is, it is a, a, an, uh, an honor and a pleasure um, for, and prideful, uh, occasion this evening for me to be here and uh, to welcome you all on, on this occasion when we're presenting our newest thematic report um, on the situation of children in adult criminals in the adult criminal system in the United in these United States of America and um, to present we decided to present it here in Colorado whilst we were having this 169th um, period of session um, would be a, a very good idea um, because normally we are in Mexi in, in Washington DC or in one of the um, um, capitals south of America um, so we we think it's a very appropriate thing to to um, launched this report in sort of almost mid-America. Um, so, in this report, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights analyzes and addresses the situation in the United States in which children and adolescents are accused, prosecuted, and sentenced in the adult criminal justice system. Uh, um, and are incarcerated in adult correctional facilities. It's very strange, but very early this morning, about six something, I heard a news item about a judge right here in Denver who would have to decide on um, whether a 16-year-old uh, girl who is accused of murdering her, her cousin a 16-year-old uh, girl and murdering a six-year-old um, cousin um, would be treated uh, and, uh, as an adult and tried in an adult court. So this, this report um, is very, very timely and in this state um, as well. Um, this exposes children and adolescents to serious violations of their rights to life, personal integrity, and due process, among others. Because once they have been determined to be an adult, they cease to have the special protection children uh, um, 
an adolescent should have in any criminal justice system. The Commission reviews the um, relevant, in the report, the relevant principles and guarantees of international human rights law, which specifically govern the treatment of children in the criminal justice system, as well as applicable overarching principles of children's internationally recognized human rights. The report concludes with recommendations geared towards assisting states to strengthen their efforts to respect and ensure the rights of all children who come into contact with the criminal justice system. This report and the working visits and expert meetings which preceded it were prompted by information received by the Commission regarding the situation of children who are treated as adults in the US criminal justice system. In a March 2013 hearing before the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, during its 147th period of session, civil, session, civil society organizations addressed the impact of the practice prevalent in some US states of incarcerating persons younger than 18 years um, in adult prisons. The Commission notes that there is both national and international concern over the situation of children and youth facing the adult criminal justice system in the United States, as well as o uh, over the laws and policies in place in some US states which fail to protect the rights of children in conflict with the law. <coughs> The United States federal government has acknowledged on different occasions during the preparation of this report that its official data, official data collection systems do not provide reliable information regarding the number of children nationwide who enter the adult criminal justice system as a result of state laws. Pursuant to its mandate to monitor and report on the human rights situation in the Organization of American States, of uh, uh, Organization Member States, States, Member States, the Commission carried out various visits to, uh, to the United States in light of the troubling information it received regarding children being treated as adults in the US criminal justice system. The Commission visited the state of New York in April 2014, the state of Colorado in October 2014, and the District of Columbia in February 2015. In each of these working visits, the, commission delegation, the Commission's delegation was received by state authorities and civil society representatives, and they visited the jail and prison facilities in both the adult and criminal ju just and juvenile systems. These facilities included Rikers Island in New York, the Youthful Offender System, and the Lookout Mountain Youth Services Center in Colorado, and the New Beginnings Youth Development Center in DC. The Rapporteurship on the Rights of the Child also met with youth, young people, who had formerly been incarcerated in adult correctional facilities, as well as their families, and with other civil society representatives. The commission was also planning to visit Florida, but and was granted access to all the facilities and meetings with authorities of that state and, of, uh, and also Michigan. Unfortunately, the commission could not travel to these um, um, that state and city, um, but, it, you, uh, but used the information it gathered from those states as well. The Commission called for an expert meeting on February 2nd and 3rd, 2015 in Washington, D.C. The meeting was organized by the Rapporteurship on the Rights of the Child to receive inputs for the report and nine experts participated. The Commission considered and approved the draft version of this report in, on September 5th, 2017, pursuant to Article 60A, subsection A, 
sub-article A, I beg your pardon, of its rules of procedure, the Commission forwarded the draft report to the Government of the United States on September 22, 2017, and requested it to present its observations within 30 days. On November 27, 2017, the United States requested an extension until January 15, 2018. By letter dated December 12, 2017, the Commission informed the state, the United, the, the, the United States, that the requested extension had been granted. The United States sent a communication on, on January 25, 2018, informing the Commission that it had not they did not have any comments to submit. The Commission approved the final version of the report on March 1st, 2018, and we are very pleased to present it to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would now give the floor to the Commissioner, Rapporteur for the Rights of the Child, and First Vice President of the Commission, Esmeralda Rosamena de Troitiño. She held office in Panama's judiciary. She was justice of the Supreme Court, of which she was vice president. She also presided the Chamber of Criminal Cases and was judge on the High Court on Children and Adolescent Affairs. She participated in the special commission that proposed constitutional reforms in Panama on 2011 and on the commission that elaborated the Code of Constitutional Procedures in 2016. She has a degree in philosophy, letters, and education with a specialization in pedagogy, and as well as a degree in law and political science. Her postgraduate studies are in gender with a specialization in family and childhood as well as constitutional affairs. So we couldn't have a better representative to now share with us the contents of the report. Muy bien, muy buenas noches a todos y todas. Aquí entonces van a necesitar ustedes la traducción. Yo sé que todos los hablan inglés, pero no sé cuántos hablan español. Eh, quiero hacer un especial reconocimiento a las organizaciones que han contribuido en la elaboración de este informe que como hemos escuchado, ha sido un proceso bastante extendido, un proceso largo, pero en el 2017 alcanzamos eh, lo, el, el logro de la aprobación del informe y hoy su publicación y divulgación. En mi condición de relatora para los derechos de niños, niñas y adolescentes del continente, me es eh, muy, muy grato poder tener este, este contacto y yo celebro que sea en este país, realmente lo celebro, eh, porque para la Comisión el tema de la justicia juvenil, justicia penal para la adolescencia, de manera especializada. Eh, y cuando decimos justicia penal es porque los niños, niñas y, o adolescentes entran de alguna forma en contacto con la ley. Y mire que digo en contacto con la ley y no en conflicto con la ley. En conflicto es cuando ya hemos demostrado que el adolescente ha cometido el hecho y se le ha declarado eh, culpable. Pero para la Comisión, este tema es una responsabilidad del mandato y del compromiso que tiene la Comisión y que se mostró desde el primer informe que la Comisión emitió sobre esta materia en el 2001, identificando de alguna forma herramientas, estándares jurídicos que los, los, los estados tenían que observar para dar cumplimiento a 
las obligaciones internacionales en esta materia. El informe que presentamos tiene como eje central nuestra población objetivo, son los niños, niñas y adolescentes que tenemos que identificar como las personas de quien estamos hablando dentro del marco del derecho internacional. ¿Quiénes son? Son las personas que aún no han cumplido los 18 años. Debo destacar que para el continente, Estados Unidos fue un modelo a seguir en la instalación de la justicia especial para la niñez, creándose el primer tribunal de justicia juvenil, 1899. Eso está muy lejos. Pero nos sirvió como eh, el gran aporte para reconocer que era importante hacer un sistema diferenciado para atender a este grupo de la población cuando entra en contacto con la ley. También reconozco de una manera muy particular cuál, cuál fue el papel que jugó Estados Unidos en los debates para la producción, la elaboración de la Convención, de la Convención de los Derechos de los Niños, que fue adoptada en 1800, perdón, en 1989. Los números así eh, se cruzan. Sin embargo, hoy Estados Unidos es uno de los dos países que no ha ratificado la Convención de los Derechos del Niño. Por eso, nuestro informe plantea una recomendación muy precisa para Estados Unidos. La importancia de reconocer en sus leyes internas el estatuto condición del niño, niña, adolescente, como toda persona que no ha cumplido los 18 años, reconociendo su condición de persona, su condición de sujeto titular de los derechos y las garantías reconocidas para todas las personas, junto con garantías y principios básicos de todo el ordenamiento jurídico internacional de los derechos humanos que también son aplicables a los niños, niñas y adolescentes. La no discriminación, el ser oídos, escuchados, que sus opiniones tengan un, un valor, que se atiendan sus opiniones y que el compromiso de, de asegurar el derecho al desarrollo pleno, con esto estamos garantizando la construcción de su ciudadanía desde la infancia. Como un efecto negativo, directo, que tiene la situación para la niñez y la adolescencia cuando son acusados, procesados y condenados en el sistema penal de los adultos cuando son privados de libertad en centros para adultos, juntos con los adultos, exponiéndoles a graves violaciones a sus derechos, con un particular énfasis en violaciones a principios y garantías esenciales, como son el debido proceso, la estricta legalidad, esta protección reforzada que su condición de persona en desarrollo, las normas exigen. El informe tiene dos capítulos sustantivos, tiene uno que comprende conclusiones 
y recomendaciones. Se incluye eh, muy, muy profundamente, con mucho sentimiento, poemas que fueron escritos por niños y adolescentes que vivieron esa realidad de detención en centros para adultos. Y hoy quiero hacer un reconocimiento muy especial, un homenaje por la participación que de hoy, que tenemos hoy, poder escuchar a Elvir y a Dominic, que nos van a brindar un mensaje también de sus experiencias vividas. Esperamos que este informe pueda servir como un aporte, un mecanismo, una herramienta que permita al Estado que le, le, que le ayude, que le sirva para que se puedan adoptar medidas, las medidas necesarias, las medidas básicas para que los niños, niñas y adolescentes no ingresen en el sistema penal adultos de adultos y evitar que sufran estas graves violaciones a sus derechos que hemos identificado. Esta no es una situación que, 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 que no tenemos una información que nos permita eh, hacer este pronunciamiento y que en, en la búsqueda de estas recomendaciones, de estas soluciones, el informe plantea el conjunto de recomendaciones. Hemos dicho la fecha de aprobación de este informe, de acuerdo con información con la que la Comisión ha trabajado, alrededor de 200.000 niños, y digo niños porque también están en la categoría de los 10, 11, 12, 13 años, y adolescentes que estaban en, en, que entran en contacto con el sistema penal de adultos en Estados Unidos. Cada año es una cifra realmente eh, impresionante. Eh, informaciones más recientes podemos decir que esto se ha ido reduciendo. Sin embargo, el número de niños que están en contacto con el sistema penal de adultos sigue siendo un número significativo. ¿Y por qué significativo? Por las consecuencias, consecuencias negativas, porque el sistema de adultos no está preparado para atender la, la, la especialidad o la especificidad del de asunto de, 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 de niños, niñas y adolescentes. Eh, no hay una posibilidad de la atención adecuada cuando están en recintos con adultos y en contacto con adultos. Y, y hemos eh, calificado, cinco veces más están expuestos a sufrir una violación o abuso sexual, dos veces más expuestos a recibir tratos abusivos por parte de los guardias, si hacemos la comparación con los adolescentes que están en un sistema de justicia especializado. Y quiero decir inmediatamente que los sistemas especializados también demandan, y así lo ha, lo ha reconocido eh, la Comisión, de la necesidad de que los estados se a, adecúen a los estándares internacionales en la materia. Podemos destacar que un alto número de niños, niñas y adolescentes han sufrido aislamiento solitario. Algunos casos en particular encerrados hasta por 23 horas del día. Es decir, una hora del día con una posible actividad externa. En este primer capítulo sustantivo se describe la situación de los niños en el sistema 
eh, just, de justicia para adultos. Ya decíamos, Estados Unidos tuvo un rol protagónico en la, prote en la protección y promoción de un enfoque especializado para el sistema de justicia, colocando desde esa, desde esa fecha, desde ese momento, los objetivos de un proceso pedagógico para enfrentar la responsabilidad de los adolescentes que estuvieran en contacto o en conflicto con la ley penal. Eh, no castigar, sino rehabilitar, aunque las R's no me gustan, eh, a veces no, te, ¿de qué tenemos que habilitarlos? La condición, este, este, es una cosa eh, traumática, no, 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 yo sé que no fuiste tú, <ríe> eh, pero, pero bueno, eh, con cinco minutos no tengo muchas cosas que decir, pero, pero lo, que, lo que quiero enfatizar es que hay situaciones muy puntuales que para el sistema judicial eh, de, de los adolescentes en Estados Unidos, nosotros tendríamos que identificar como las razones que pudieran atenderse, tomarse en cuenta para una transformación o para, para atender una recomendación que hace el informe. Y esto es lo que voy a apuntalar porque no voy a tener más tiempo. Eh, ¿Cómo o por qué ingresan los muchachos en, en, en el sistema de adultos? Hay tres vías principales, precisamente eh, dependiendo de las leyes que rigen en cada estado de la Unión. Y, y son tres, son tres circunstancias o tres eh, factores. Uno, las leyes que otorgan directamente que la jurisdicción de los tribunales de adultos pueden juzgar a los niños, niñas y adolescentes. O sea, esa es la primera fórmula. Hay leyes que otorgan esta jurisdicción directa. ¿Por qué? porque no hay una identificación de quiénes son los niños. Ah, no, pero el que tiene 17 años ya no es niño. Y por eso yo he hecho mucho énfasis en, en destacar niños, niñas y adolescentes. Porque, porque ese es la, el, 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 el kit del asunto. No sé si kit es lo que ustedes entenderán. Eh, el, el, segundo, el segundo centro de, de atención que hay que tener. Hay leyes que permiten que casos de niños y niñas y adolescentes sean transferidos por el, al sistema penal, del sistema juvenil al sistema de adultos. Y en tercer lugar, hay disposiciones que, son, que tienen unos efectos muy similares como las leyes que establecen que una vez... En, en, en el juzgado, si el, si el chico entró en el juzgado de adulto, se le va a tratar como adulto siempre. Es decir, ahí se produce una ficción jurídica. El niño, por esa disposición, deja de ser niño, deja de ser adolescente. Se convierte en adulto cuando no lo es. La pregunta que yo haría, eh, ¿tiene además ese chico que se convirtió por ficción jurídica, eh, lo, los derechos, eh, la capacidad jurídica del adulto, eh, tiene toda la, la, la posibilidad de, de votar, de, de ejercer derechos políticos. Entonces, eh, pero, pero el efecto para el niño es precisamente que su condición, su condición de protección especializada termina, porque el sistema lo ha transformado en, en, en adulto. Eh, ustedes ven todas las hojas que te voy a tener que pasar. Eh, yo quiero eh, destacar eh, un, una problemática que el, en el sistema eh, de justicia penal de adultos respecto a los, a los chicos es 
las cifras de niños, niñas y adolescentes afroamericanos, representando el 16% de la población juvenil del país. 28% de estos jóvenes son detenidos, 35 de estos jóvenes son, 35%, son transferidos a los tribunales de adulto, utilizando alguna de las tres circunstancias en las que se, ha, se hace posible esa, eh, esa eh, eh, inclusión de eh, los chicos. Entonces, eh, la, 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 la totalidad de niños y adolescentes procesados en tribunales de adultos afroamericanos es realmente eh, eh, dura, dura porque eh, en esa comparación de la población eso es lo que se nos refleja. Yo quisiera, eh, si me permite eh, la organización, de, de, de destacar, destacar eh, las recomendaciones eh, el, la necesidad de, de proteger a los niños como eh, que están sujetos a su, a su jurisdicción. Y yo quiero señalar, no se trata de no reconocer que el adolescente puede cometer un hecho delictivo, puede cometer un hecho delictivo grave, ese es otro dato que también se tiene. Eh, no solo las detenciones provisionales o las condenas con penas privativas de libertad, se dan por delitos graves. También se dan por delitos menores. Y, el, y, y, y la clave es el tema eh, patrimonial o derechos de, eh, patrimoniales, eh, o, o el control patrimonial. Entonces, eh, hay una responsabilidad que... La Convención de los Derechos del Niño lo tiene muy, muy, muy marcado, muy bien marcado la especialidad de la justicia de niños, niñas y adolescentes. Pero los otros instrumentos internacionales, la propia, la propia Declaración Americana de, de, de los Derechos eh, Humanos, la Declaración Universal de los Derechos Humanos, tiene el reconocimiento de la necesidad de la protección especializada y reforzada que requiere la, eh, la vida de los niños. Y yo concluyo señalándoles por qué necesitamos la protección especial y reforzada. Porque en este proceso del desarrollo pleno de todas las dimensiones del ser humano que se dan en las distintas etapas de nuestras vidas, en la etapa de la infancia, la niñez y la adolescencia, se hace necesario que la sociedad, la humanidad entera, sepa que el desarrollo pleno de los niños nos lleva a construir ciudadanos responsables, nos, llega a, nos lleva a construir vidas de seres humanos con valores, con respeto a los demás. Entonces, la, la exigencia de un tratamiento especializado es garantía para la humanidad. Gracias. Thank you very much. Um, in this process of writing a report, the commission um, consults with civil society and receives information from civil society and uh, victims, and also information and collaboration from states. Uh, in this regard, the commission, as the president said, conducted several visits to states, uh, including Washington, D.C., where we met with um, different authorities. And so we are very pleased to have um, representatives of the government of the United States here present in the presentation of this important report. And I'm going to give the floor to Andrew Stevenson and Thomas Weatherall. Andrew 
is a career civil servant within the political section of the U.S. mission to the OAS. He was instrumental in establishing the Open Government Partnership launched by President Obama in 2011 as a global effort by 55 plus countries and civil society organizations to redefine the relationship between citizens and their governments. Mr. Stevenson served as Chief of Staff to Ambassador Carmen Lomelin, former U.S. Permanent Representative to the OAS on Secretary John Kerry's policy planning staff. And as a special assistant to former Deputy Secretary of State Robert Solek and Under Secretary of State Wendy Sherman. Mr. Stevenson holds a BA in political science and an MA in international affairs. Mr. Thomas Weatherall is an attorney in the Office of Human Rights and refugees in the Office of the Legal Advisor. Dr. Weatherall advises the department on a range of human rights issues, including self determination and indigenous people's rights. He has participated in litigation before federal courts in the United States, international arbitral tribunals, and the International Court of Justice. Dr. Weatherall holds a BA in international relations and an MSc in diplomatic practice, a JD and PhD in international law. We are very pleased to have you here. Thank you. Um, no, you don't have to press her. Thank you very much, <laughs> well, and thank you. Uh, Thank you, Madam President and Commissioners, plural. It's really a pleasure for us to be here in Boulder to reaffirm the role of the United States before the Organization of American States and also the Inter-American Human Rights System. I wanted to begin by providing some opening remarks uh, regarding our engagement here, and then also my colleague Tom will speak a little bit about the content uh, of the report that is being presented today. As a civil servant within the U.S. mission, I am pleased to convey the decision, support for the decision undertaken by the commission to hold its current period of sessions here in Colorado uh, in collaboration with the University of Colorado at Boulder. It reflects certainly our collaboration with the commission and with the university on its recent memorandum of understanding. That's a very important advance and allows us to also talk about our collaboration and the work of the commission uh, in very different fora than we would normally do. Um, outreach within the United States by international organizations like the OAS and certainly the Commission can be very useful because such engagements help us and you to explain and clarify the mandates and roles of such bodies. In the case of the OAS and the Commission, the United States is in a unique position as serving as host for both bodies' headquarters. This is an honor and an obligation we take seriously. Let me begin by sharing some general views from the perspective of the State Department, the U.S. mission to the OAS. We increasingly and regularly look to regional partners to join us in speaking up wherever and wherever democratic principles we all share in our hemisphere come under attack. And there are places in our region where those principles are under attack right now. A proactive response to human rights and democratic accountability is important because in some countries in our region, civil society organizations are facing great challenges and repression. An effective response to these threats can include a variety of bilateral and multilateral elements, such as stronger protections for human rights defenders, new strategies to strengthen the rule of law to address impunity, and protections for our hemispheres most vulnerable, such as children and adolescents. In the face of these concerns, the United States does recognize that we cannot be the lone voice calling attention to them. When democracy is threatened in our hemisphere, we encourage all states and civil society to speak up. To this end, we engage through the OAS and the Inter-American Commission to build support for human rights and democracy throughout our hemisphere, including through visits to the United States by the Commission and by engagement on the part of the US with the Commission. For more than a half century, the Commission, which in many ways is the crown jewel of the OAS, has protected the rights of individuals against government overreach and abuse. In short, the Commission's groundbreaking work has changed our hemisphere for the better. As a result, there are people who are alive now who would not be but for the effective action of the Commission. Those who would violate human rights, restrict liberties, civil liberties, or otherwise weaken democracy have also been identified called out and deterred. To be sure, this can be a difficult and controversial task, but it remains important in ensuring that our hemisphere reflects values which have long bound us together. 
our hemisphere remains justifiably proud of the work that the Commission and its sister institution, the Inter-American Court, have achieved. That said, the foundation for this success and for the sustained progress of these institutions in human rights lies in the continued independence and autonomy of the Commission and the Court. Over the past five years, and this is probably something many of our colleagues here are not aware of, there has been a robust dialogue in the region regarding the operation of the region's human rights system and how it can work more effectively. For its part, the Commission has engaged in a productive dialogue with member states and civil society, very much what we're having here today as well. Several positive changes have resulted from this dialogue, including a 5% increase in funding. For our part, the United States has worked hard to underscore with fellow Latin American and Caribbean countries that the Commission remains a tremendous force for good in our region, deserving defending and should continue to be strengthened. Working with partner governments and human rights defenders, we resolved in recent years to take actions to help maintain the Commission's funding sources and preserve its independence. Simply put, continued political and financial support to the Commission is key to reinforcing its capacity to help governments address these challenges. This leads me to my last point this evening, the importance of continued government engagement with civil society. Through ongoing processes at the OAS and other regional fora, the United States has consistently encouraged governments to open spaces for dialogue amongst themselves, but also with civil society and citizens. This is tangible, positive progress, as we have seen this week here in Boulder, and is also illustrated by our, our own participation here with you tonight. For our part, we are also matching words with action in the Americas. The United States is supporting over 30 democracy, human rights, and labor programs at the OAS and in the Western Hemisphere, totaling approximately $40 million. Significant portions of this portfolio include projects that support civil society capacity building, the rights of youth, the professionalization of journalists, and support for free and independent media. And as tonight's presentation demonstrates quite clearly, we also remain committed to supporting human rights and sustained engagement with civil society and critics, including within the United States. Thank you for the opportunity for us to participate here tonight. We continue to welcome views, comments, and observations on how we can continue to work with partners, with students, with academics, governments, and civil societies alike to address the pressing human rights challenges that affect the entire region, not just the United States. So thank you, and I'll turn the, uh, my, the microphone over to Tom to talk a little bit about the content of the report. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Madam President, commissioners, friends at the table. Um, I will present brief remarks prepared with the help of the Department of Justice. The National District Attorneys Association, the NDAA, has published national standards and policy positions for juvenile justice matters. Those standards and policies are based on the expertise and well-considered positions of professionals across the United States. They differ in many significant respects from the positions expressed by the Commission. Most generally, the Commission and the advocacy organizations whose positions are reflected in the report believe that the criminal justice system should be concerned only with the offenders rather than with their victims and with public safety for society as a whole. For example, the Commission report states that the child's best interests should be the primary consideration in every decision imposing or continuing a custodial measure with respect to him or her. The NDAA, in contrast, finds that while the best interests of the child theory is well-intentioned, it is difficult to define and does not take into account the needs and interests of communities or crime victims. The NDAA notes that a more complete model for juvenile justice developed in the 1990s gives balanced consideration to three goals, community safety, offender accountability, and competency development in offenders. The model is called the Balanced and Restorative Justice, or BARJ, model. The NDAA encourages prosecutors to implement this balanced approach in their individual jurisdictions, and many states have adopted the BARJ model, or similar restorative language, in their juvenile codes or policy documents. With respect to serious and violent offenders, the NDAA recommends that decisions by prosecutors to transfer cases to criminal court should be made on a case-by-case -case basis. The NDAA recommends that prosecutors make transfer decisions on a case-by-case -case basis and take into account the individual factors of each case. 
including the gravity of the current alleged offense, the record of previous delinquent behavior of the juvenile charged, and the ability of adequate treatment and dispositional alternatives in juvenile court. The limited number of juveniles in the adult correction system demonstrates that prosecutors and courts are making reasonable decisions in such cases. As of year-end 2016, the Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Statistics reported fewer than 1,000 juveniles held as adults in prisons and 3,700 in jails. These numbers represent a sharp decrease from the 2009 and 2011 numbers cited in the Commission report. With regard to racial and ethnic disparities in the juvenile justice system, the Department of Justice's Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, OJJDP, Formula Grants Program supports state and local efforts to prevent at-risk youth from entering the juvenile justice system or to intervene with first-time and non-serious offenders. The program also provides funds to enhance the effectiveness of the juvenile justice system. To receive funding, states must commit to achieve and maintain compliance with the four core requirements of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, which are one, deinstitutionalizing status offenders, two, separating juveniles from adults in secure facilities, three, removing juveniles from adult jails and lockups, and four, addressing disproportionate minority contact, or DMC. <coughs> If a state fails to demonstrate compliance with any of the core requirements in a given year, OJJDP will reduce its formula grant for the subsequent fiscal year by 20% for each requirement with which the state is non-compliant. OJJDP has received current guidance, uh, revised, I'm sorry, current guidance to help states in their efforts to reduce DMC. OJJDP worked with practitioners as well as federal and state stakeholders to ensure there is feedback from the field about the current system, as well as how the new system might improve performance in the DMC and core protections arena. Data will now be collected on five research-supported points of contact in the court system where DMC most often occurs. Arrest, diversion, pretrial detention, disposition commitments, and transfer. By focusing states' reduction efforts on these five pivotal points of contact, and by enhancing technical assistance to states aimed at reducing disproportionate contact of minority youth with the system, OJJDP hopes to see significant reductions in DMC. Um, I'll conclude by thanking the Commission again for the opportunity to appear before you today and for your important work in support of human rights across the hemisphere. Thank you. We now I'm going to turn the floor to our civil society representatives. And first, I'd like to give the floor. And first of all, I'd like to thank the two organizations that are here. They were very important in the production and, uh, and in, in the review of the information that the commission gathered throughout all of its mandates. And we're very grateful that you are here. Brian Evans. As the State Campaigns Director, Brian leads the campaign in supporting state advocacy efforts and providing technical assistance to states. He works closely in partnership with state-based organizing groups seeking to change juvenile justice policy for the better. Yeah. Prior to joining, CFYJ, Brian worked for six years assisting numerous state-based advocacy groups as the campaigner and director of Amnesty International, USA's death penalty abolition campaign. A seasoned criminal justice and human rights advocate, Brian received a master's degree in Middle East studies from the University of Texas at Austin in 1992, and from 1997 to 2007, served as a Middle East country specialist for AIUSA, while also organizing grassroots efforts to challenge capital punishment in Texas. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Um, hope you can hear me. Um, as you, uh, thank you, commissioners, um, for let me take this off. For having me uh, and having this gathering and producing this terrific report. Um, it's it's very timely for those of us who work on. Uh, ending or reducing and then eventually ending the, the uh, charging and sentencing and incarceration of young people in the adult system, which is the goal of our organization, the Campaign for Youth Justice. 
Um, I'm going to talk briefly in maybe more detail about how kids end up in the adult system and then a little bit about very recent trends and recent concerns about um, what's been happening in the past couple of years. So to start with, um, and the commissioner already talked about why transferring children to the adult system is bad, <laughs> but you have to talk about why. Um, we know that the juvenile system is better equipped to address the educational and developmental needs of children. That's basic. We know that children in the adult system are at greater risk of assault, of being placed in solitary confinement, and, and also uh, four or five times more likely to commit suicide than in the juvenile system. It's a very dangerous place for children. And uh, for us as working to change policy, we, we also know um, that children who go to the adult system have much higher recidivism rates. So it's actually a bad public policy to send children to the adult system. It actually harms public safety. It doesn't help public safety. So every state has some method of transferring children to the adult system. There's no state that doesn't do it. Um, we have slightly different or slightly more narrow categories in the report. There's the um, automatic transfer that is uh, legislated in law. If you commit a certain crime, automatically transferred. There's uh, the, the ability of prosecutors to directly char charge a child as an adult, which uh, prosecutors like a lot. Uh, then there's the transfer by, uh, by judges, judicial transfer, where an independent arbiter gets to hear the facts of the case and the, the facts about the individual child. And then there's the sort of fourth bucket is the exclusion by age, like all 17-year-olds are charged as adults. That's the one that's shrinking the most because states are changing that. So in statutory exclusions or automatic transfer, um, these are mostly applied to children who are charged with more serious crimes, homicide, armed robbery, and it generally that they are, are applied to older children. With uh, prosecutorial direct file, um, there are, I think, 12 states, including the District of Columbia, that allow prosecutors to decide on a certain range of cases whether a child goes to the adult system or stays in the juvenile system. Um, there are about half of those states, there's no process for the child to appeal that decision. Some of the states have a reverse waiver hearing where the child can say, no, I sh shouldn't be up here. Uh, about half the states do not even have that. Um, most of these uh, are, again, for more serious crimes, but in the state of Florida, if you're 16 or 17, the prosecutor can charge, continue the adult system for any felony under the sun. Uh, Florida leads the nation in, in transferring children this way. Um, and one of the problems we've seen in Florida, particularly but also in other states, is the power of prosecutors to use this threat of charging you as an adult to get a plea bargain. And you have, you have children who are pleading to a crime before they're even formally charged, even before all the evidence has been presented. And that's, that's, not, a, that's not good for justice. Uh, so um, the third method, the judicial transfer method, is I guess if you're gonna transfer a child, probably the best method because you have a judge who's not on the prosecutor side, not on the defense side, who hears not only the facts of the case, but also hears the facts of the child. What, what has this child gone through? What's his background? What's his experiences? And I think studies have shown that, that judicial transfer is, is the most effective form at getting children in the adult system most appropriately, if you consider it appropriate to send a child to the adult system. The other, the other methods, you have a lot of children who are not convicted, who, who, who are uh, not, end up not being, even having the case dismissed, whereas with judicial transfer, you have more, kind of a more accurate, to put it, more accurate kind of transfer. Um, in practice, unfortunately, a lot of judges still will look at the facts of the case more than anything else. It's sort of, uh, it's faster that way, and it's, it's in, ingrained in a lot of training that, that the facts are the most important thing. And the facts are important, but they're not the only important thing, particularly when you're dealing with a child. Um, but that's one of the drawbacks of judicial transfer is you still have this, this process where 
of the judge will might, it'll be more or less just like automatic transfer. If the facts are this, you go up. If they're not, you, you don't. Um, age exclusion is, is the form of transfer where we're seeing the most activity as people trying to reform the system. Um, this is where a child who's, every child who's 16 or every child who's 17 is automatically tried as an adult. Um, when our organization started in 2005, there were, I believe, 13 states that tried all children who were either 16 or 17 as adults. There are now only four that have not changed their laws. So this is, this is something that's really, really moving. And the state of Michigan, as you all, I'm sure, know, is, is currently considering legislation to do the same thing. Uh, the state of Vermont actually this year for misdemeanors raised the age of juvenile court jurisdiction to 20, which will take place in the year 2022. So in the year 2022, all teenagers uh, will be, who commit misdemeanors, will be uh, kept in the juvenile system. Uh, so now, so um, in, in, in the absence of a state that doesn't transfer children at all, the best practices as far as we're concerned, it's a state that only has judicial transfer, that doesn't allow, doesn't have arbitrary, you know, automatically every child uh, a prosecutor decides, or every child a legislature decides is sent to the adult system. There are five states that only use judicial transfer. Those are California, Hawaii, Kansas, Missouri. Once they raise the age, their law that raised the age of jurisdiction to, to 18 goes into effect. Uh, three years from now, and Tennessee. So those five states are probably the best that we have right now. Um, as the commissioner mentioned earlier, one of one of the little twists is that if you're charged, if you're convicted as an adult, once your any future interaction with the law, you're treated as an adult, and all five of those states do that. So it's not the case that every time a child goes before uh, gets arrested that they're going to be going before a judge before they're transferred. Um, so the trends that we're seeing, certainly the, the passage of raise the age laws, raising the age from 17 to 18 or from 16 to 18, as was the case in New York and North Carolina. Uh, as the commissioner mentioned, the numbers have dropped very significantly. Though Those are the biggest numbers. And we now think there are, if you think this is a small number, less than 100,000 children a year are sent to the adult criminal justice system. Um, it's still a very large number, uh, it's, but it's less than half what it was just a few years ago. And when the states that have passed raise the age laws, like New York especially, because there are a lot of kids in New York, uh, when those go into a full effect, we'll see that number drop even further. So we are seeing, because of that, uh, got it. Um, the reforms that are gonna come after that are going to be much more difficult because you're dealing uh, mostly with children who are accused of serious crimes, of, of violent crimes. And um, I've, the issue that has not been tackled successfully, I think, very much at all is the issue of racial disparities. As, as the commissioner mentioned, the numbers, particularly for African Americans, are, are very bad. And the deeper you go into the system, the worse the numbers get. And that's obviously, the United States of America is a country that has a long history of not successfully dealing with racial disparities, uh, particularly in the criminal justice system. So it's, it's not something we're going to change overnight. I'm glad to hear that OJJDP is, is, is still committed to um, the work on disproportionate minority contact. Um, and, um, and so far, it just we haven't seen either at the state or federal level a lot of success in that area. Uh, the last thing I, I want to mention is, is that in, since the new administration came in, we, we've, seen, we've, we've seen sort of our sea change in sort of the rhetoric around criminal justice. And I think uh, we see it reflected in talk about how there's a national crisis in violent crime when there is not a national crisis in violent crime. Um, when we hear a lot more talk about gang enhancements, mandatory minimums, the, the things that uh, were popular in the 1990s, which led to mass incarceration, mass budgets, and uh, that conservatives and liberals who work in criminal justice agree was not an effective approach. 
Uh, so we, we are very concerned that we're going back to that and that that will harm our children and make our work on racial disparities that much more difficult. And we're also, while I'm, I'm happy to hear about OJJDP's ongoing work, we are concerned that the same sort of mild version of rhetoric is coming out of OJJDP and that we are seeing they withdrawn from some guidance documents that were issued under the previous administration and some pages from their website are being removed and things like that and, and we'd, we'd love to work more with OJGDP on that to, to make sure that the, the good content stays on the website. But we are a little concerned that, that those kind of things seem to be in flux and there seems to be a different tone right now and eventually that different rhetoric is gonna lead to policies that are gonna be more harmful for our children. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Finish on time. Thank you very much. Um, I'll now give the floor to Anles Addis, who is an associate attorney with the law offices of Deborah Lavelle and the ACLU of Michigan's Juvenile Justice Without Parole Initiative. Her work focuses on human rights of people in detention and the rights of children in the criminal justice system, collaborating on impact litigation using a human rights framework to ensure that all are treated with the humanity and dignity to which they are entitled. She is a founding member and president of the Youth Justice Fund, an innovative nonprofit foundation which addresses the long-term impacts of childhood incarceration through the broad community engagement. Anlin was selected as a national representative to the UN Committee Against Torture for issues affecting youth and is a co-author of Basic Decency, Protecting the Human Rights of Children. Welcome, Anlin. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I would like to thank the commission um, for having us here today and um, for addressing the issues of children um, who are in conflict with the law and their treatment. Um, is this better? Um, I would like to reiterate um, from the commission's report that this is one of the only situations that I certainly can think of where an individual's status, a part of their core identity is transformed. Um, they are lost when they uh, lose their child's status and are treated as an adult. There's a transformation that takes place that I cannot think of another example where this essential part of your being is taken from you. And I would just um, reiterate as well that when this happens, um, when you lose your child's status and become an adult, um, this is the time where um, the abuse happens, um, when you lose the protections that we have afforded children and that um, are afforded to youth in, in all other contexts. Um, and this includes long-term placement in solitary confinement and isolation, um, physical and sexual abuse, um, and excessive use of force by um, staff. Um, in addition, um, I would like to um, also note that this situation has not received enough attention. Um, it continues to be one that does not receive um, the the emphasis that it should. Um, and I would like to thank the commission for shedding light on this issue and um, addressing it in the human rights context. Um, and I hope that it continues to inspire additional dialogue um, with the United States and other um, Americas uh, so that we continue to address these issues um, because in reality, um, the issue from arrest to mass incarceration as adults starts with our children and when they come in conflict with the law, how we choose to treat them. Um, and then just finally, I cannot walk away without addressing the issue of race that has been brought up um, by both the commission and um, other colleagues at the table and, the, and acknowledge that solitary confinement um, transfer to adult court, placement in adult prisons, um, placement in solitary confinement is disproportionately affecting children of color. And we see it in Michigan and we see it in other jurisdictions across the United States. Um, and it is one situation that has long-term 
harm. Um, and that it is important that while we also continue to acknowledge the harm that is caused by addressing children and treating them um, as though they were adults when they come in conflict with the law, that it also has continuing consequences for children and that the harm does not continue or end. It does not end once they are released, but that it continues as they return to our communities and that it is important that we as um, a country acknowledge this harm and um, work to address it um, for our future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was not prepared. <laughs> I'd like to um, extend the commissioner's warm welcome to Alver and Dominic for being here. We are very honored that you have come and shared this table with us. Um, I don't know who of you wants to speak first. Um, I'll, Dominic. Alver. Alver grew up in an immigrant family in Hamtrak and was sentenced to two years in prison when he was 15 years old. While 16 and still incarcerated, Alver got his GED. Alver loves working with his hands and making the world around him more beautiful. Alver recently relocated to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and has taken his interest in making things more beautiful to the outdoors, and currently works for a landscaping company. Alver recently celebrated three years of sobriety and sponsors several young men on their path to recovery in a 12-step program. In 2017, Alver joined the board of Youth Justice Fund having a deep understanding of the long-standing impacts one can face after prison, Alver wanted to find a way to let youthful returning citizens know that they are not alone. He has a passionate advocate for those who were harmed by childhood incarceration and is actively engaged in breaking down barriers and building connections with partners and community members along the way. Welcome, Alver. Thank you. Um, I'd first like to start off by uh, thanking the commission for acknowledging the seriousness in this situation, the seriousness of this situation, what we're dealing with. Um, I'd like to open up with a poem that I've written that I read to several people who do come in and how we could all relate, so if you guys don't mind. Hi. I wrote it to my mother. She was recently deported. And uh, so I like to, when I keep honest with myself, I feel like I keep honest with everybody in the room. It's... Dear Mama, the judge don't understand me. See, I turned to a life of crime because I came from a broken family. Hidden behind the cracks, why they calling you illegal? The land of the free but silent screams for my people. And dear Mama, why do you always work late, but we're still so poor? I can hear you crying late night through our bedroom door. See, lost tales of Robin Hood between my head and a muffle. Maybe I might get us out of this jungle and get you out of your trouble. Maybe I'll make mistakes that will cost me a lifetime. Maybe I'll become an alcoholic and indulge in these white lines. And maybe in time, they'll make me want to hang from a tight line. But maybe they'll let me live in misery reading these real rhymes. Dear Mama, I shouldn't have let them catch me. Instead of living sad in jail, I could have died free and happy. And the brother in my cell? He's 15 as well, and it's hard to adapt when we're trapped and our backs in this living hell. Dear Mama, I'm sorry to disappoint. See, the crimes that I've committed let me take it to the joint. And this isn't Willy Wonka. See, I don't understand. I was just a little kid. I never planned to be a man. They're calling me a criminal or a number. Now I'm trapped. See, how do I explain? I may be never coming back. And I'm bitter like I'm dying. There's so much I haven't seen. And I know you never dreamed your baby will go to prison at 15. Don't worry. I won't let them take control. They already stole my innocence. I won't let them steal my soul. A release wasn't a relief. I might as well go grab the trigger. Fuel my rage up with my hate. Gain some weight and pay them back when I am bigger. Dear mama, I'm released. Where have you gone? Why do they make you pack up all your clothes and now we're selling our home? And wait, mama, I said I'm sorry with the pain in my eyes. You see something different like you witnessed that your baby had died. And dear mama, late night, I can't sleep. I start counting my breaths. The Minahan mocks me as if to be counting my regrets. Where's justice? Where's freedom? Where's this American dream? Where's my childhood? Where's my peace? These things are promised to me. Ask me how do I adjust? I might frown or laugh. See, it's hard to pick someone apart when they're already broken and wearing a mask. Can you see anger in my eyes or hurt? Sometimes it's hard to tell. When the screams keep me up and my minds feel like it's being held. 
What I really can't explain is there nobody there. What I really can't explain is just that nobody cares. See, I won't ask you to walk a mile or carry weight on your back or change the way you sleep and I'd ask if your feelings intact. And I won't ask you for your empathy of the tears that you cried. I only ask you. If they ask you, you say my name and reply. Now, I just want to touch a few basic topics that you know I've heard around the table. Once again, I'd like to thank the commission and the president as well. Your openings really, it opened me up because sometimes I just don't understand how serious it is and what the numbers are behind everything. Um, I'd like to, like, what it's like for me to have my human's right, like my human rights snatched away from me, because that's, that's what it was. I, I didn't have human rights being in a prison cell at 15. See, the funny thing was, they made me wait to get a certificate of a GED till I was 16, but had no problem sending me with adults when I was 15. Now, things that I witnessed in prison were me being solitary. It's funny that you guys mentioned that. I did several months, 23 hour lockdown. Now, I know animals in cages who don't have to witness that. I mean, we feel more, there's more humanity in the world when you'll see an animal on the side of the street and you'll give them something to eat and you'll comfort them and you'll take them in your home. But when a, chi a child commits a crime, he gets sentenced to prison. Um, I'm sorry, I'm still, it's a little emotional, I apologize. I mean, I just, I wanna be treated as a human, not a number or a prisoner. You know, I'm being judged, we are being judged, all of us are being judged off the worst things we've ever done as children. I mean, there's, we've all done stupid mistakes, and that's what it was. These were mistakes that we made because of our living arrangements, because of the, where we lived, or you know, our, our, our financial situations, because we didn't have people able to come out and say, hey, this is how things are. I know I didn't. I didn't have that opportunity. Um, you know, I just, I just want to make it clear that I'm speaking for myself, but I speak for everybody that I lost, I lost my childhood at 15. I lost my peace of mind. I lost my serenity. I, I'm sober currently. The reason I wasn't sober was because I had to intoxicate myself to, to live with the assaults, the verbal, the sexual, the mental, you know, the, the being caged. You know, so I just appreciate everybody being here, and I appreciate that you guys let me have the chance to talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Dominic Passmore was born in Detroit and grew up in Flint, Michigan. At the age of 14, Dominic was tried as an adult for armed robbery and sentenced to 9 to 15 years in adult prison. Active and passionate by nature, Dominic examined everything he thought he knew about character and masculinity and learned as much as he could about mass incarceration and the criminal justice system. Emboldened by his renewed sense of self and nuanced understanding of systemic oppression, Dominic completed his GED and left prison on his earliest release date. Since his return home, Dominic's determination, resilience, and positive, positivity has brought him immeasurable success. Dominic has maintained steady, gainful employment, achieved financial independence, returned to school, and completing his certification in personal training in pursuit of his career goals. In addition to his personal successes, Dominic has been active in the community and continues to share his experience of childhood incarceration and successful return to the community. He has spoken at a wide array of community events, including fundraisers for mentor mentorship programs, the University of Michigan's Conference in Adolescent Health, and to incarcerated youth at a local juvenile detention center. Articulate and involved, Dominic has also shared his spoken word poetry at various youth justice fund events and spends his free time playing basketball and trying to bring levity to all situations. Welcome, Dominic. Thanks. I want to um, 
first off, I want to thank the commission also. Um, first and foremost, particularly, I also wanted to like specifically thank Esmeralda for her speech because like it touched me like in a in a crazy way. Like I can't explain it. But I promise you, like, I'm not here to read stats. I don't know stats. Like, honestly, I don't I just I don't know the stats of the prison system. Um, and I promise you that what I speak here today, you can look back one, two, three years from now and you won't find out in two days that it came from Michelle Obama. But what I can tell you is that every time I remember, I used to see, I used to stand out, stand in front of my door. Majority of my prison time, it was like higher level. Um, oh, I also want to t thank Elvira for that poem. And I'm gonna speak, I'm gonna speak one of my own in a minute. But I used to stand outside the prison, uh, I used to stand inside my room, my cell, and I remember I used to see like, you know, guys in like suits, like, and, and it's rare to see like a man in a suit, like walking walking through a a a, 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 a prison hallway and the, the contrast is just like unable to like comprehend, right? But it's like, I used to think like maybe this person is like important, right? I used to think like maybe maybe it's actually like we actually like getting some change. Maybe this means that we are getting some type of change and somebody is actually looking into the wrongful doings of the government, the correctional officers and whatnot. But like that help never came. And it's like I'm not here to speak for myself because like I already went through everything that I'm going to go through like as far as prison goes. I mean, hopefully, but I'm here to speak for like the people that's in the position that I was in because it's still kids in prison. No matter what the stat stats say, the number of kids in prison today is ridiculous. And so in prison for me, like I had to, I turn to poetry, right? I turn to working out. Like anything I could do to possibly get my head away away from that that kind of thinking because I realized like I, I was helpless. It's like no matter I I wrote so many grievances it's like it made my head ache. And it's like when grievance after grievance after grievance go to Lansing and then they give me a response back saying like I can't prove it or something like that. And then like when when like somebody in a suit comes and then the correctional officers tell us that we, we gotta act a certain way so that they won't see that the day the way we get treated daily, they won't they won't see that. Instead they'll see how the CO's acting professional now since they here. And so I can't I can't I can't speak all my pain through this this one poem, but like it's crazy that through the speeches that I heard today I realized like this is the perfect poem for the day. So I like to get that y'all listen to it. <sighs> my sister, my brother, my father, my mother, all relevant through blood, but what is blood if we can't talk? And what is blood if we can't walk? On this earthly path together. On sunny days or through stormy weather. And it said that God can fix me. But Lucifer says that he can restore me better. So who do I believe when the blood of my blood steady sheds and makes my soul oh so wet? I choose to ride like Maya Angelou and let my soul fly high in the skies like God's angels do and see the beauty in the storm the same beauty that makes that cold jail cell seem a little bit warm and makes that little black boy hope that one day they'd use those keys to open that door instead of making it slam behind his back and when I say black lives matter it's not to say that others don't 
But when we dying by the hands of those who's supposed to protect us most, then who's to stand up for us when others won't? Plenty tears stain my face. Plenty years stain my race. All divided by the belief that the value of a dollar can take you to a better place and stop those tears from running down the sides of your face. Undivided by race, I see peace and harmony. But others don't want peace because they see it as potential harm to their money. Not knowing that time is the investment. Not knowing that love is the only thing that matters to be the best in. Not knowing that money won't be in that coffin to earn that we all have to go rest in. And so my family is love. Be there for me. When with others I'm shunned. And when my back's against the wall, stand there and plant your feet. Don't run. Um, I want to ask both of you something. This. Would you consider letting us have your poems to put on our website? Yes? Yes. yes. We would be really honored to do that. And I think they're important poems for us to give that kind of publicity to millions go to our website. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming here, for staying here, and for engaging in this very, very important topic for the Commission. We will continue to follow up on this. We hope to have many more dialogues, and we thank you very much for this. Uh, esto es, esto es, el objetivo de, no solo de, del informe, es lo que necesitamos que como miembros de la humanidad, reconozcamos eh, el valor de todos los seres humanos. Eh, nuestras leyes en materia de justicia penal juvenil, yo quiero decirles que mi, mi contacto con este tema, de lo que hoy me siento, hoy particularmente me siento muy orgullosa, es que en mi país, Panamá, la propuesta de una ley especial del, del sistema juvenil, no solo en el cumplimiento de un mandato de la convención, sino, y ese, ese fue mi argumento en la presentación de esta ley ante la Asamblea que conseguimos, mi planteamiento fue los adultos tienen un sistema que garantiza derechos fundamentales, que garantiza, y valga la redundancia, las garantías procesales, las garantías de un debido proceso, la, los principios de la estricta legalidad para la actuación de las autoridades, todas las autoridades responsables. Escucharlos, a ustedes dos, eh, bueno, me, me, me llena de, de, de mucho sentimiento y lo, 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 lo reflejo muy rápidamente, pero es la respuesta. Embellecer el mundo, eso es grandioso. Y volar para encontrar que todas las almas, que todas, juntas, no importa, ni raza, ni color, podemos alcanzar el amor. Eso es realmente maravilloso. Muchas gracias por esa oportunidad 
de haber compartido conmigo este, estos mensajes de ustedes. Gracias. Buenas noches.